Hello and welcome to this Royal Society Publishing video podcast. Today I'm talking to you Dr. Claire Spottiswood, first author of the biology and ethics paper A Stab in the Dark, Chick Killing by Breed Parasitic Honey Guides. In the 18th century, Edward Jenner described in the Royal Society Journal The Philosophical Transactions how common cuckoo chicks eject their foster siblings when newly hatched. In their new paper, the authors show how the African parasitic honey guides are even more brutal in how they exploit their hosts. Claire, could you tell us a little bit about the uh, great honey guides and why they're so interesting in terms of evolution? Sure. Well, uh, great honey guides are intriguingly bizarre birds. Um, in fact, they're, they're most famous for another, for another of their interactions with other species, that with humans. Um, uh, in fact, great honey guides are probably the only bird species in the world that genuinely communicates with humans. And this comes about because um, honey guides love to eat energy-rich wax and they therefore guide um, human honey hunters to bees' nests to help them to gain access with their fire and tools. This has actually been beautifully studied um, in the north of Kenya by Hussein Isaac who found that, um, that human honey hunters um, uh, find bees' nests um, substantially more efficiently when they're being held by a honey guide compared to looking on their own. And uh, in the course of my field work in Zambia, my field assistants and I are often, um, are often guided, are, are often beckoned uh, by uh, guiding honey guides, in which we then follow and find the bees' nests, whereupon my field assistants uh, b- build a fire to um, smoke away the bees, uh, chop open the hive, and uh, gleefully eat the honey. And we then leave a bit of comb as a present for the honey guide, and everyone's left smiling. But what our work concerns is a very much darker side to honey guides, um, since um, in addition to these mutually beneficial interactions with humans, there are also um, extremely virulent brood parasites of, of other birds. And just to remind you, um, brood Parasites are the cheats of the bird world that exploit the care of other species to raise their young. And of course, c- cuckoos are a famous example of this, but brood parasitism has actually evolved seven times independently in birds, um, not only in c- cuckoos. And um, the honey guide family of Africa and Asia is, um, is one such family of cheats. C- cuckoos and honey guides share a more specialised uh, uh, trait in common, and that's that in both of these groups, the, the uh, young parasitic chick while newly hatched, still blind and naked, kills the host chicks um, in the nest and thus ensures that, the, that, that it can monopolise all of the food um, brought to, to the nest by its foster parents. In the, in the case of the common cuckoo, as, as Edward Jenner first, first discovered in the 18th century, this, this is done by, um, by, by hoisting the host chicks onto the parasitic chicks' back and then tipping them over the rim of the nest. But honey guides can't do this because they, um, because their hosts all breed in uh, deep inside holes in trees or in or in uh, or in t- tunnels underground. So the um, honey guide chick hasn't got anywhere to tip the host young, and instead it's it's evolved an alternative, uh, rather wonderful adaptation for getting shot of its foster siblings. And we have a hint of this as soon as the um, uh, young honey guide begins to hatch from the egg, because it hatches already equipped with these um, uh, uh, needle sharp hooks at the tip of its beak. They used infrared cameras to film the nest in Zambia. Can you tell us what you observed? Well, this film is all um, in grainy black and white because, as you mentioned, it's filmed un- under infrared light um, owing to the pitch dark in, in the inside of these underground holes. In this case, this is the nest of a swallowtail bee eater, and um, the big chick in the foreground is the, um, is the uh, chick of a honey guide that's hatched about two or three days earlier. And the, small, the, the smaller chick uh, to its left is a bee eater chick that's hatched um, about half an hour before uh, this film was taken. And those two white blobs in the, in the foreground, of course, are unhatched eggs of the beta that will um, soon meet the same fate. So as you can see there, the, the honey guide has, has the host chick by the head, although the fact that it's the head seems to be just a coincidence. They sort of flail out at random and simply bite whichever, whichever part of the body is closest. We've now filmed this uh, in a number of nests and um, found that uh, just one to five minutes of actual active biting time is enough to kill a host chick. But honey guides often pause between bouts of biting, unfortunately for the hosts, so they can take anything from uh, nine minutes to even seven or eight hours to die. And is there a reason that this behaviour has not been described in the wild until now? I think the main reason is that um, honey guide hosts all breed in holes, either deep inside a tree branch or underground, which makes it very hard to see the goings on in the dark. Um, But of course in the last few years video technology has become so much better that it's now relatively straightforward for us to to see what's going on inside host nests. I'm also very fortunate in Zambia to be helped by a fantastic team uh, of local nest finding assistants who are able to find large quantities of host nests, which of course makes everything possible. 
I should mention, though, that uh, there is one de description from the 1950s of um, a chap called Gordon Ranger who um, who described a honey-guide chick biting a host chick in the palm of his hand. And he wrote rather wonderfully of how, um, in testing the power of the honey-guide's bite, he had his tongue punctured by the upper hook. I must admit, I haven't been that far yet in the name of science. How does the mother of the parasite chick help her offspring, if at all? That's a good question, because the chick-killing behaviour of the young honey-guide is the culmination of a sequence of adaptations that all help to ensure that the young parasite has sole occupancy of the host nest, and these begin even before the parasitic egg is laid. So most birds lay their eggs at 24-hour inter intervals, one every day. But um, in hunt guides, and indeed also in cuckoos, eggs are laid every 48 hours. So what this means is that the, the parasitic female is able internally to incubate her egg for an additional 24 hours, even prior to laying it, which means that the, the young parasite has a, has a day's head start in embryonic development. But we also know that, that um, honey guides, uh, just as is the case also for cuckoos, develop unusually fast as embryos. And we don't yet know how this comes about, but it's possible that the um, female parasite helps her offspring along by investing um, extra quantities of useful s substances such as carotenoids or, or, or hormones that uh, help the embryo to d develop faster, but we don't really know yet, yet very much about that yet. In the, the species uh, that we study, uh, the, uh, the greater honey guide, the parasitic female also has one extra also has one extra trick that gives her offspring a head start, and that's that she punctures host eggs at the time when she lays her own egg. So um, these holes in the shell, of course, tend to cause the host embryo to, to die and fail to hatch, which, which means the, the parasitic chick has less opposition when it in turn hatches. But sometimes the parasitic female will overlook an egg, or an egg will, will be laid after her visit, and, th and this happens in about a third of eggs. Uh, of host eggs that are therefore undamaged and do hatch, and it's these chicks that the um, parasitic chick then has to deal with when they hatch. And what about the host mothers? Does she do anything to protect her brood? Well, oddly, she doesn't at all. In fact, we even filmed a beta parent trying to feed a honey guide chick, which was halfway through busy biting one of its own chicks. So um, it seems that they're quite blind. It is, of course, pitch dark in there. I mean, we could also speculate that under some circumstances, aggression among the host's own chicks could be to the host parent's advantage in order to reduce the, the size of the brood during times of scarcity. So it is possible that that has pre pre prevented such interventions from, from evolving, but that's pure speculation and we don't really know. So why doesn't she recognise the parasitic chick and simply just not feed it? Well, that's a very good question. Um, in the case of the honey guide, it might be that the host parents are, um, are fooled by the fact that the honey guide gives food begging calls that sound amazingly to our ears at least, like an entire brood of, of host chicks begging for food. So in the darkness of the nest hole, it's quite possible that the host parents think that they're feeding a very hungry brood of their own, not one big fat parasite. But certainly in brood parasites, more broadly, we still don't really fully understand why it is that host parents are so easily fooled by a parasitic chick. One th theoretical possibility is that it's very hard for um, host parents to evolve uh, chick discrimination, and this is because this would require them to, uh, to learn the appearance of their own chicks. But if we were to imagine a host female who was unlucky enough to be parasitized the first time she bred, she might then imprint on the wrong species, and in future uh, go on to throw out chicks of her own. She'd only be good for raising parasites. So it might be that these very high costs of potential misimprinting could pr pr prevent chick d d discrimination from evolving. So how did your study indicate that the parasite chicks are made aware of the host chicks in the nest? Well, we don't fully know the answer to uh, that question. It, I think we can safely uh, rule out sight since, as you point out, um, it's pitch dark in there. Uh, and it would seem that perhaps um, the chicks, uh, the movement of the host chick is, is a more uh, likely cue than its body heat since a half-maimed chick that's lying still alongside the honeycomb will tend to be left to uh, die in peace, alas, uh, rather than being b being attacked further. But it's certainly very striking to watch a host and honey guide chick lie apparently at peace alongside w w one another for minutes or even hours, whereupon all of a sudden the honey guide will burst into life and uh, start to attack the host chick. Um, it may just be that in these lulls in between uh, episodes of biting, the honey guide is simply uh, regaining its strength. Uh, uh, certainly the way that, that, that the honey guide pants heavily in between parts of biting would imply that it might be energetically quite expensive to, to carry out this very vigorous biting behaviour.
You mentioned that the honey guide's killing behaviour might not actually be in its best interests. Why is this? Well, yes, indeed, that is a possibility. Uh, just as a highly virulent pathogen might do best not to kill the animal that it's infecting, so a brood parasitic chick might do best not to inflict the maximum amount of damage on its hosts. And specifically, this is because by killing host chicks, the parasitic chick loses their assistance in stimulating the parents to bring food to the nest. Uh, and indeed, the parasitic chick, being bigger than the host, needs a lot of food. And uh, work done by my colleague, uh, Becky Kilmer, on the brown-headed cowbird um, of the Americas, which, which, which doesn't kill host chicks, has uh, shown rather beautifully that, that, um, that cowbird chicks actually do best when they have two host chicks alongside them to help them to stimulate the host parents. So it's in their interests to temper their degree of virulence to ensure that they, are, um, that, 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 that they get fed at a maximum rate. So it might be that honey guides might actually do best not to kill host chicks. We might speculate that since all of the species of honey guide, as far as we know, all have billhooks and kill host chicks, that the, that the greater honey guide has simply inherited this, uh, this adaptation that it's now stuck with and unable to evolve its way out of, even though it might perhaps do best to keep host young alive al alongside it. But all this needs to be uh, answered through experiments, and at the moment it's really just speculation. So what will be your next step in this research? Well, with regards to the chick-killing behaviour itself, we're certainly interested um, in learning more about the de developmental and physiological adaptations that allow the parasitic chick uh, to carry out such physical feats so early in life, when it's only just a few days old. But more broadly, um, in honey guide, something that we're very interested in is how specialised adaptations to exploit d d different host species are passed on from one generation of parasites to the next. So uh, great honey guides, for example, at my study site, commonly parasitize about five species and, um, and show specialised adaptations to exploit each one. So we might ask ourselves how a uh, female honey guide fl fledgling goes on not only to parasitize the right host species, but also to inherit the right set of adaptations for exploiting that host. And this is something that we're investigating at the moment using genetic approaches. Thank you, Claire. And thank you for watching this Royal Society Publishing video podcast.